a lot. Um, our first keynote speaker is a former WTO Director General from 2002 to 2005, and he's the former Secretary General of Angtad during 2005 to 2013. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Supachai Panichapak. Dr. Sopon Napaton, Vice Minister for Ed Education. Dr. Gamalin Pinit Pudon, <coughs> Director of the International Institute for Trade and Development. <coughs> Dear friends and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is really uh, a rare occasion that uh, these days I would have the chance to be speaking uh, at least about some of the issues which used to preoccupy me for more than a few decades, and particularly in the last decade when I was very closely involved with the, the rise, I wouldn't say and fall, uh, the rise of the multilateral trading system throughout the 1990s into the beginning of the new millenniums and now uh, I don't want to predict the demise of, <coughs> of the system but when I heard the MC announcing that we are going to have a five alarm test I thought he was meaning it meant it for the global trading system a five alarm test it actually made me think that uh, something like this kind of test a sort of a fire alarm test should be also instigated uh, in the case of the, of the multilateral trading system and also globalization. We should raise some fire alarm some, sometime because, uh, as you all know, we are very much at a, at a crossroad, as a crossroad of how to wiggle ourselves out of the so-called the new normal situation. For me, it's not new and it's not normal. But people call it new normal, so I use it new normal. It's not new because situation like this happens way before when, uh, during the times of the GATT, when we didn't have the World Trade Organization, people just went that way to have their own kind of trade liberalization efforts that more or less, more or less, uh, uh, has left out uh, the rest of the world, which has been the South, the European countries. And the GATT has been called a sort of rich man club, things like that. We changed that, that's why I said the rise of the, rise of the, of the global trading system after 1994, 95, when we actually established a World Trade Organization, was really a, sig uh, a significant time. A sort of purple patch leading up until 2006, 2007, when we now being confronted with a totally new con, uh, configuration, totally new scenario in which uh, we may not have faced before. We may not have faced before. And so uh, I, I, I find this, uh, this, this conference, uh, the regional forum as organized by the ITD, is something which is uh, proverbial, the proverbial timely, timely to be discussing inclusive trade sustainable trade and sustainable development. To have sustainable development, you need sustainable trading system as well. Uh, but if you look around, uh, situation is not very conducive for uh, the things that uh, uh, we would have to rehabilitate. Now, a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, a big storm was raised, not only in the teacup, but a big storm was raised because uh, one of the world's foremost economists, Professor Samuelson, Robert Samuelson, wrote an article before he passed away, 
few years before he passed away, but it was a few years ago already. But I mention this because this comes a time in which we need to discuss things like this even more. Normally, Prophet Samuelson, together with most of the American economists, would have supported liberal free trading system, right? Uh, normally, they are the one who actually help move the free trade agenda forward. But what Professor Samuelson wrote a few years before he passed away was very significant in the way that he addressed the issue from the other side. He addressed the issue from the size of the impact, impact of the free trade on global, global development, on global transfer of technology, on the global creation of jobs which is something not always uh, being done in the areas of uh, economics of trade. Because normally we discuss trade, we discuss uh, trade in the areas of exchanges of goods and, and services and tariffs and, and whatnot. But impact of trade, most of the time it has always been, as far as I could recall, it has been the United Nations system, and particularly Angtat. And I'm very pleased to see one of my dear colleagues from Angtat, Sir Paul Hansen, being uh, part of our meeting uh, today so that uh, you can hear from the horse's mouth what Ankat is thinking about all this sort of thing, not only in trade facilitation. But it was mainly, it was mainly the development side of the argument that has always argued that it's not trade for trade per se. Trade is only a means to achieve other things. Value added, level of productivity to be increased, transfer of technology, certain gains in, in, in certain areas, value added. So uh, this is something that we want to establish. And when comes a time that we have become so uncertain of the fruits of international trade on some of these economic variables, the key ones, then you would see the kind of pervasiveness, the proliferation of the, we are the bottom billion around the world as we are seeing today. Because what Samuelson was writing, and it was really quite controversial in those days, was that he was not very sure whether free trading system, under the circumstance, under the assumption of unlimited liberal flow of technology, you have to remember this because in the beginning of the trade theory, uh, trade was discussed as something which is, well, in the beginning static, st static and then dynamic, but never in relationship with the transfer of technology. Simonson was saying that when there was free trade and when you have countries with lower cost of production competing, that is okay because then you can compete, you can compete through uh, uh, R&D, as we've been saying, compete to the quality of, product, uh, of our products, uh, compete through the uh, transportation and other things, better trans uh, trade facilitation and things like that. But, but when you have the te technological development, development which is easily transferable throughout the world, the gains that have been made through, let's say, the cheapness of wages can be elevated to the level that it's not only the cheapness of the, of the labor, the labor intensive and things like that. It's going to be added with the kind of quality and the kind of, 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 of technology that we have never seen before. And the technology has been always, in these days, very transferable. And particularly when we are working on the, on the opening up of the TRIPS agreement and all this sort of thing, uh, uh, so that the intellectual property rights could sometime be easily more, uh, 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 more easily transferable. But Samuelson was saying that the comparative advantages that used to be in the hands of the American laborers has been lost because of the cheaper laborers coming out from Asia. That is still negotiable. That's still something that uh, can be uh, negotiated and can be uh, uh, well, not eliminated, but at least compensated by the level of productivity of those laborers in the United States. But when the productivity begins to increase in Asia with the addition of capital investment and technological transfer, uh, transfer then 
we, the American labor forces, are going to lose out forever. That the transfer of job is going to take place on a more permanent basis. And this is actually uh, create quite a storm because Samuelson was saying that under this present, uh, under the new circumstance of a free flow of technology, maybe we have to think twice. And that has created a lot of uh, surveys in the United States, people being asked uh, of the questions whether they are, you know, uh, still in support of the free trade agreements, and, and you can see that gradually every year in the United States as well as in, in Western Europe, that the support for the multilateral system, free trade system, has been less and less every year. Whereas in other parts of the world, and particularly in Asia, the Asian economies keep, remains quite open, very much trade oriented. So you can see that uh, in order to recall ourselves, in order to recall, actually, to, to move out, to jump out of this new normal situation, which is very depressing. Low growth, very, very high unemployment, uh, youth unemployment, huge, massive, twice the size of normal rate of unemployment, uh, trade flows around the world, anemic, 1%, 2% points, uh, compared to six, seven, eight percent before the uh, subprime crisis, so things are really uh, in in quite driven into a corner as to how we're coming up. And the way that economists has been telling the world that we should wriggle ourselves out of this by not going through the old model of export-oriented macroeconomic policies. We should, we should turn a little bit more inward to be more balanced. What they say is to balance domestic demand with external trade. Right? We have been told that. Uh, and and, and you, if you have listened to some of our colleagues in, uh, in the West, particularly in the United States, you would have heard that the Asians are actually the culprits of everything. The Asian, of all people. The Asians are the culprit of everything. The Asians save too much. We save too much. We send too much of cheap capital to the U.S. so that the U.S. consumers and households can borrow so cheaply and spend and spend and spend until they just collapse. So this is a, this is a fall of the Asian. So they turn the whole theory upside down. And what we are told is that the Chinese, the ASEANs, and all these people in Asia, they should save less, invest less, consume more, eat more. Consume more, consume more, be more greedy. You have one car, you should have 10 cars. You, should, you go on holidays once a year, that's little, that's chicken feed. You should go 10 times a year. You should keep consuming, consuming. And that should help bring back the kind of reflationary impact that we need. Now, this is a theory that I don't know how to call it a name. For me, it is just so much of a nonsense. Although it's quite accepted. Uh, I have said this since the time I was in Geneva that I don't accept this theory that we have been saving too much, that's why we create all these problems, right? The problem is that those who consume don't save at all. You see, they turn it around. Those who consume so much, they did not save, they use borrowing to consume. Why the Asians, they save, they consume, they invest so much investment, so they create excessive capacity. Yes, the Chinese, Chinese at the moment, the biggest problem in China is how to wind down the excess capacity. Problem for Asian economies as a whole is that they have been investing heavily, and now they have to wind down some of this investment. Particularly now this day, last few weeks, and I just had a meeting with friends from China during the, the Boao uh, the conference, you know the Boao conference, Boao conference, and let me digress a little bit. Boao conference is something like the Davos conference for Asia. Davos happens in Davos, Switzerland. Boao takes place on the island of Hainan uh, in the south of China. It has been 16 years. You might have not heard of, you might not have heard of Boao, but it's been around for 16 years. It has been something of a, of a sort of uh, Asian and the rest of the world getting together same same concept as at Davos, but it's uh, uh, maybe a low profile. But for the first time, Boao came out of Hainan, came out of China, to be uh, uh, to be organized here in Bangkok for the first time. It's Boao outside of China. It's Boao Bangkok. 
So Boal Bangkok took place uh, last week. I'm saying this because uh, there were economists, friends uh, from China, former trade ministers and uh, deputy prime ministers who came over to Thailand and we were discussing. We were discussing as to how, how, uh, uh, well, how, to, how to get organized again. How to get organized again. Because the world has, not, has been disorganized, dysfunctional in the way that the global governance is in the hands of nobody. It's in the hands of the G8, G20, but it's in the hands of nobody. It's, it's, it doesn't make any real impact on policies around the world. Were you, were you not surprised when you saw President Xi Jinping appearing at the Davos conference January this year? And none of the leaders of the United States being represented there. Well, of course, Mr. Trump was still to be inaugurated and things like that. But what Mr. Trump was saying in the United States and what Mr. Xi Jinping was saying in Davos was just poor opposite. It used to be on the other side. Yeah. You know, and now it just swapped parts. President Xi was saying, look, the ills of the world today are not because of globalization. The ills of the world today are not because of globalization. Mr. Trump in the United States was saying the ills, all the ills of today, unemployment in the United States, balance of payment deficit, all because of globalization and all this free trade agreement. So let's pull out. President Xi was saying, no, we need more of this. We need more globalization. Chinese will work with the rest of the world, with China, with um, Europe, the rest of the world. We want to cultivate the way we're going to create linkages and, and all this sort of thing. And therefore, I have conceived of this uh, the new Silk Road, modern Silk Road, what we call now the Bell and Road Initiative. So uh, this is something that we were discussing last week, whether we should have a verdict on how to approach globalization. Or should we leave it like this? Should we leave it like this so that it will be, it'll be just market mechanism that would influence how globalization will move backward, forward, deglobalization happening, or resentment, resentment with globalization that is actually happening around the world so much today. I have already talked about uh, one, of the, one of the purest critics, Professor Samuelson, who used to be the supporter of, of globalization, expressing his concerns with the, with the plight of the US economy in the light of free trade agreement, free flow of capital, I forgot one thing, free flow of capital, and also free flow of, of technology. So uh, this, these are the basic tenets that I just would like to uh, present to you uh, as uh, something that uh, Fundamental things, balance, demand, globalization or deglobalization, how to approach it, how to wriggle ourselves out of this uh, process of, of, of so-called new, new normal. Now, I give you a few, uh, a few brief remarks on, let's say, the, the, the basic health of the global economy these days. You, you may know already better than I do, but let me go through them before I, I comment a little bit on, on uh, how to deal with uh, the resentment of globalization and ending with something that I would like you to, to recommend to you to give it a thought. If you can do it, support it and, and move the agenda forward. What I would like to say is that in spite of the few swallows in spite of the few swallows that we are seeing in the global economy this day, the global summer, economic summer, has not yet broken out. In spite of the few swallows, you see some swallow fly, you see for the first time in seven years, the IMF has been actually correcting, moving their forecasts upwards. Normally every year, IMF would make huge forecasts, growth like that, employment like that, trade like that, and then Quarter by quarter, IMF will be turning down, turning down, turning down. I, I used to say uh, IMF is sort uh, of cheerleaders for the global economy. Maybe they are in the, in the uh, you know, they've been tasked to do that. They're global cheerleaders. Keep everyone cheerful that, you know, we are not, we are not, uh, uh, should not be depressed. This is the situation that we can go through. We are pushing 
all our money, liquidity, as never before. Have you seen this kind of thing that has happened before? Never in the history, global history. QEs one, two, three in the United States, Europe would not do QE in the beginning. Later, they decided to do QE and not end it yet. Japan started to do a huge thing in QE. So you can't imagine how much cash we have flowing around the world these days. It's just tremendous, massive. And where, where do these cash go to? They don't have places in, in, in the US, in Europe, no viable investment situation, not yet you know, suitable for new investment. They flow to emerging economies. They drove up the exchange rates of emerging economies to sky high. And at the time that the global economy was suffering because there was anemic growth in the modern world, in the industrialized economy, emerging economies like those of us in Asia and Latin America and some in, in Africa, they were carrying the, the, the burden of having growth a little bit so that we can have some decent global growth. And because of the pushing out, pushing out all these funds around the world with no global governance and they don't give a, give a care, they don't give anything about, not worry about where the, the funds will flow to. So all these currencies, exchange rates of the poor economies, emerging markets, shot to the roof. And so they were stifled in the way they could trade more because with, with rising uh, exchange rates level, they lost their competitiveness and so some of the key economies like Brazil. You can see Brazil going from one day being one of the you know, economies of future into today economy that is just mines, all sorts of, sort of difficulties and recession after recession. See only Asia now moving forward with three, four, five, six percent growth uh, that, that could be maintained. But you can see that the way that we are correcting this trend of new normal and deflationary condition is not, it's not really the, the right way. How we could address, and, and, and the swallows that we are seeing uh, today, swallows in the United States economies, uh, that the Fed in the past two years could have raised four times the, the interest rates to now a bit over one percentage point, I think, uh, 1.25, 1 to 1.25. Today, the Fed Reserve, Federal Reserve, Yellen, Ms. Yellen, has come out and tried to warn the world that, look, I mean, this is, this is going to be something which is gradual. We're not, we're not trying to tell you all the world that we have already actually overcome all our difficulties. That is just what I read from, read from her messages some weeks ago when they, when they have this uh, money market committee meeting at, at, at the Federal Reserve of the United States. It's not for sure that the twice increases in interest rates in the United States this year will be followed by two more because they plan for four increases in interest rates. The signs that Ms. Yellen is saying that we may not be doing this interest rate rises again, it means that the U.S. economy is still not back to the same old health. It may have been able to sit up on their bed, but to start running or even to think of competing at the 100 meters run, it's not possible. And the key issue, what the main uh, stream economists these days are looking at, at is, is at the rate of inflation. Can you imagine today, compare it to, let's say, a few decades ago, when we had to fight and fight against inflation? Today, we are fighting against the non-rise of inflation, the deflation. Today, the US Federal Reserve is saying, because inflation rate in the US is just lingering, very dormant, down below 1.2, 1.3, now 1.4%, below the target of 2%. In Japan, the same thing. In, in Europe, in Asia, in Thailand, the same thing. Inflation rates under the target rate. And so all economists are worried. This again put me into a lot of, a lot of uneasiness. Because as, a, as an economist trained in the, in the school of central banking, I, I rejoice. I just rejoice in seeing that we are living in a situation where the threat 
to the livelihoods of the poor people because of the uh, rising inflation. It's not there. We can do many things. Our, our money has, stab has stability. They're not losing value every year because if inflation would have gone up so high, we would be losing the, 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 you know, the, the power of money every year, the value of the money. So now we're okay. Stability in the exchange rate markets, also all right. Because the inflation rates are not so high, so the effective real exchange rates are more or less more stable than before because the movements in, 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 in prices are not that uh, strong, not that uh, destabilizing. But everywhere, and they just had a huge meet meeting in New York Federal Reserve inviting all the key central bankers to sit together and, and think about how to unwind, how to unwind their their quantitative easing, how to unwind the easy money policies and all this sort of thing without impacting upon the rest of the world. But I'm saying that because of this sign, the swallow in the United States is not the real summer. Not yet, not the real summer yet. And people are now adulting. That's why the stock market in the US and in Asia is just, again, rising up quickly because with no interest rate rise, it means that uh, uh, people can put their money into this equity and, uh, and, and, and in invest more into those areas without fearing uh, uh, the, the rise of interest rates. You look at Europe. Now, uh, I have some European friends around here, I guess, but I, I've always been straightforward with Europe. Europe would need to take care of itself. Europe cannot be a burden to the world. I'm saying this, I'm not European, and some are European, well, they never like when I say this. If you cannot take care of yourself, you will be a problem to the world, Euro. Why? Because if the Euro is not strong, it's not strong or stable. If European economies is full of unemployed people, you cannot trade right. You cannot just trade or go around and tell people, I'm going to open my borders for everyone to come in, open my borders for the goods and everybody to come in and trade and do everything. You just cannot do it in Europe. And you cannot even guarantee how the euro will survive the kind of discrepancies between different economies in Europe. Discrepancies in Europe. There's no two track between northern and southern Europe, for example. Every time Greece has to negotiate extension of IMF loan, it's a drama in Europe. Touch and go, touch and go. Whether we would have uh, Greek going through or not, IMF, IMF has been telling Europe all the time, the way to resolve Greek sovereign debt issue, the only way, you need haircut, you need debt forgiveness. You cannot go through with telling the, Greece, uh, the, the Greek economy to slow down and slow down even more and stop breathing, slowing down, slowing down until one of these days. Greece economy has been slowing down for the last five years. If they do it for 10 years or more, there would be nothing left in Greece. Well, and so, deflationary, deflationary impact, uh, less pension fund, everything is right. I mean, but whether it's the right time or not, you know, I mean, too many people in the, into the public sectors and things like that. But every time IMF has to negotiate with the Greek economy, it's a drama, and it's always at the last minute always at the last minute they say, okay, because otherwise if we don't do this, then the whole thing will collapse again. And so they give more. And this has been building up. It's been hundreds of billions of euro that the Greek has been borrowing from the IMF. You remember the, the so-called financial crisis in Asia 15 years ago? Altogether, the money that IMF has been giving to all of us here would not come down to the same level of all that IMF has been giving to only Greek economy alone. And yet, we don't see the end inside of Greek economy. Adding to this with the pedestrian, the well-known Brexit negotiations, Brexit negotiations would not hurt so much the British economy as the rest of Europe. I'm saying this. I'm saying this. Why? Because then the, Brit the British economy, on their own, they would have more leeway of doing things that they think they can do it besides outside of the European Union. For example, having, having more deals on a bilateral basis with the, less of their common, with the rest of their Commonwealth grouping. With India, for example. 
They could not do it because within the EU, they could not do more of the FTA deals. So they're free to do more deals. They're free to come and trade more with Asia and trade more with China. And look at the way, look at the way Europe has been very much uh, supporting the initiatives like the AIIB. You remember the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, right? AIIB, yes. That the Chinese has created a few years ago. Now I just had a discussion with the chairman of uh, my friend Jin Liker, uh, chair of the AIIB. He told me, I, told, I asked him, look, be careful because your bank, you know, the Americans are not subscribers, are not membership. Japan, they both, you know, don't. he said, don't worry. Our bank has more than 80 membership, more than 80 countries membership, more than the Asian Development Bank. Can you imagine? You don't know this. Huh? I just learned it from him. I said, well, you should work with ADB. He said, we are working, but we are bigger and, and we are more diversified. We are more global bank than a ADB. This I just heard from, from Lika. So again, if Europe would be able to get themselves organized and not to create something that would impact negatively on the rest of the world, if Germany would be able to reflate the economy a little bit more, to give room for Europe to have more demand inside, because how come in Europe only Germany have surplus and the rest is deficit? This is an unbalanced economy. Okay, I, I, I have so many more things to go through, so let, 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 let me try to. I look towards the rest of the world. The emerging economies, I have already told you. The other day, IMF came out with a recent announcement, which is not shocking at all to be expected. IMF was warning the world that, look, at the moment, the global amount of debt, global amount of debt, is three and a half times global output. Are you shocked? No, you're not shocked. It's shocking. Because a few years ago, it was only one and a half, two times. Now it's three and a half times. It's shocking because this is sowing the seeds of destruction. Yes, because one of these days, some of these people will default, and then you will have more default going on. And, and don't, say, don't say that this will not happen somewhere close to Europe. Because if you look at the European banking system, one of the largest European banks, few of the largest European banks are still in some difficulties. And I don't quote names, you know yourself. In some of the larger economies of Europe. And inside the system, the stress test has not really been very helpful because the stress test has not been done along the same line as the US stress test for the financial system, I can say this. And so the health of the emerging markets economies have been also deteriorating. They used to be the remaining support to the global economy in the aftermath of the recession, the Great Recession 2007, 2008. But now, the whole global system is in disarray, including the poor economy, the open economies that have been growing so well. Commodities markets were alive and well post-2018 post recession. That was, China was still doing well. But this day, China is going through what I call supply-side adjustment. China needs a lot of supply-side adjustment. Besides balance sheet adjustment, supply-side. Like I said from the beginning, we are blamed that we save too much, invest too much, so now we have to adjust. So China, uh, the Chinese government has been adjusting. But it takes longer time than, than people believe. So uh, just uh, adjusting, adjusting to the way the Chinese economy is adjusting itself is, 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 is a problem for developing countries that depends on the commodities market. That the commodities market this day is still not really in the doldrums, but not moving up. Oil prices moving up and down, so the rest of commodities are not doing so well. So we do not see uh, a lot of movement uh, uh, in, in those areas. And you can see that although we do not want the world economy or world trading system to be concentrate or, or centric on any US centric, Europe centric, or China centric on anywhere else, it's, it's moving in the direction of China more and more. That the Chinese economy more and more will be determining the way global trading system is going to be operated. Why? Because of the kind of global value chain 
the new, I wouldn't call it new, it's something that we just realize it. it's been around for so long, but the global supply chain, regional supply chain, the value chain has been around all these years. The international, the international trading system has been actually uh, driven on the basis of the supply chain. This is, this is obvious. People are saying now that most, I would say more than half, 60, 70% of the global trading system is now supported by the, the supply chain movements, that people trade within themselves, their own companies, that people produce things in different places in their network or production around the world. There's no one that produces everything uh, in one go. So uh, when one major part of the value chain slow down like the Chinese economy, then the rest would also be affected. And of course, global value chain has been dominated by the Asian regional value chain in Asia. 60-70% comes from the value chain in Asia. So actually the Asians determine all this and when China-centric kind of trade development in Asia uh, is uh, predominating, you can see that uh, why China is adjusting uh, the situation is very much un, un, under, the, under the cloud. So uh, to, to add all this with the uncertainties coming out of the so-called geo-economics geo and geopolitical agenda, then you see really something which, uh, it may not look like the, the 1930s uh, Great Depression, it may not look like uh, the situation uh, before the, uh, the First or the Second World War, but the kind of change of power that is taking place, you know, the change of power. In those days, I think it was the demise of some empire in Ottoman, or I don't know what, uh, perhaps. And now the change of power from west to east, from north to south, it, it's a new kind of globalization. It's a new kind of globalization. It's not really a kind of deglobalization that we are fearing, because globalization is actually drifting, is drifting more on the so-called exogenous factors, like the way we improve our logistics, transportations, communications, new inventions all the time. This, these are all things that create connectivity around the world that is all exogenous. Nobody can do anything to it. You don't stop people inventing new things. You don't stop people traveling, uh, communicating, listening to each other, following the news and everything. So globalization is exogenous, but transforming into something which is not the same generation of globalization as in the past. And this new form of globalization, we all hope at Antat, some time ago, we've been trying to generate the debate of, let's say, let's try to push the new form of globalization into the arena of development-led globalization or development-centered globalization or what here at ITD you might call it inclusive, inclusive trade, inclusive globalization. This is what we all try to, to do. So I'm saying this so that we would not lose hope that we're seeing new forms of globalization. Globalization that would be funds injected not by the capital intensive economies, rich economies of the North, but by the South. If you look into the fund flow this day, there's a reversal of fund flows from the South to the North, from the East to the West, because, because all these reserves of the global economy this day are being accumulated in Asia. China now doing very poorly because China used to have 3.9 trillion US dollar reserve. They put more than a trillion into US treasuries and to government bonds in Europe. These days, the Chinese have been losing some of this reserve. Now they have only 3.2 trillion. Only 3.2. But this is huge amount, together with the rest of Asia that has learned a lesson from the financial crisis in 1997, 1998. So we all have accumulated huge amount of reserves. Thailand, we need no more than 100 and 120 billion US dollars of, of reserves. Now we have nearly 180 billion of reserve money. So it's, 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 it's a new world. It, it's, it's the East, it's Asia buying up all these this concerns, companies, entities around the world. So it's a, it's a reverse kind of globalization so that instead of the West and advanced economy taking over companies from the East or the poorer countries, it's just the other way around. And this is something which is healthy. Globalization should move both ways. 
east and west, north and south, triangular, you know, it should, it should be everything in balance. It's not, not anyone playing the role of a hegemon or somebody dominating the, the rest of the world. So this is the kind of trend uh, we are seeing. But of course, uh, all these geopolitical issues uh, in, uh, in Asia, in the Middle East, in the Eastern Europe, they're not very much helpful. So uh, we, we have to take care of all these things. Now, the impact on, on, on globalization, what we are seeing, uh, Trumpism, United States, uh, you're seeing uh, one of the prime ministers in Europe, I think must be a Hungarian prime minister, talking about Ill illiberal democracy. Uh, he is right. I mean, democracy is still democracy, but it's less liberal than before. Maybe. I don't know. But they are saying that we are just uh, having a liberal democracy. It's, it's a kind of me first mentality. Me first mentality. It's never gone away, you know, the me first mentality. It's a creed of us, we first, our region first, my home first. Uh, what we say, charity always starts at home. You know, this is the thing that at the global level, we try to paper it away. We say when, uh, when I went to in, uh, my former reincarnation to all this G8 or G20 meeting, they all say the right thing. Back at home, they say different thing. Still, we're seeing this. So I have been saying all this all the time that let's do away with all this G8 and G20. They're not creating any value added to the, to the whole global governance system. They're just delaying the way we should reestablish the global governance in, in which we all could participate. You, you, you've seen the last uh, G, what is it, G20 meeting in Hamburg? What they were talking about? They were talking about Trumpism talking about how to deal with climate change that Mr. Trump is trying to change. I mean, he cannot change it immediately. He's just making some noises. But it takes time. If the U.S. want to withdraw, they cannot withdraw because it's written in the uh, agreement that they have to stay on until, I don't know, a few years forward. The G8 meeting in Isoshiba last year, I think in Japan, uh, they were talking about what, you know? They're talking about Mr. Cameron's problem with Brexit. They were sharing up, they were saying we should vote. And G G G7 was saying something which is the British part, saying that they should support Mr. Cameron. And Mr. Cameron lost, lost out. And that's what all they, they did. Nothing about how to reflate, how to regenerate growth in the global trading system. They didn't even think of inviting China to join. How can you have G7 meeting talking about the global economy and just pushing out the elephant in the room, just leave it there and not discuss it. It's just not going to work that way. So, again, uh, the rulemaking exercise, that all these mega deals, uh, we are talking about, oh, I think not here, but it's the challenges, the challenges of the rising, I don't know, populism and protectionism and the way that we are seeing some of the major economies trying to push, uh, let me say frankly, and as a, as a former employee of the, the World, Trading, uh, World Trade Organization, maybe I should not say this, but anyway, last year when Aung Thad was meeting in Nairobi, Aung Thad 14, I was saying to, this to uh, in front of Ro Roberto Acevedo, my old friend from the WTO. This is an existential threat to the multilateral organization like the WTO not to the Antat, to the WTO. If we all will be trying to make our rules outside of the multilateral trading system, multilateral uh, institution like the WTO, we're trying to do that. Because TTIP is going to do that. The trade, what is it, Tran, Pacific Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, all these are men for me, this is my own reading, to take away the authority of the world trading system because these are all, TTIP is all about negotiations in rules making. TPP is about the WTO three plus, three plus plus, plus plus plus, that we could not agree at the WTO, so they are they going to make, create a new surrogate outside of WTO. I told this to Roberto last year, the meeting of Aung Thanh, I think 14 in uh, Nairobi last year. I said, this is existential threat to the WTO. He said, no, I'm not worried. I said, okay, good. No, you, should, you should not worry. But you should realize that if people are making rules outside of the, the WTO and be happy with it, 
you are happy, then we should all be happy. It means that it's not, doesn't, but, but I'm worried because if you are two people or a few people, 12 people, 10 people, 20 people making the rules for your own and the rest has to follow, can you imagine? Where does the ritual fit in? Or do we have to import all this into the rule? Or do we have to, to clamor to, you know, to go and, and ask for, to be part of it? No, this is, not, this is not the system that I see, but this is being moved into that direction. So I, I would end. I, I would end because I know it's coming to an hour now. So as, as usual, I, I'm going to see a little bit. But let me end by just giving a few of my thoughts. I mean, uh, uh, you know, after having listened uh, to this part, what I said, I, I, I don't have hope for this present global government. I, I'm saying that the present global government is dysfunctional, maybe non-existent. I don't call G8, G20 a global government. It doesn't represent all of us. It represents only a few. And you see the agenda. Their agenda are made by IMF, World Bank. When I try to intervene into the G20, uh, this is the truth. When I try to intervene into the G20 agenda, the only time I succeeded was when Korea hosted G20 meeting some years ago. Can't remember. Uh, I think under can't remember the name of the president of Korea at that time, but he was the only one who actually, we met, we went, I went there with, uh, with Pascal Lamy, together the two of us, uh, he supported me and I, we went to the Blue House and we gave a long uh, uh, narrative to the president of Korea that please don't put development as an afterthought on your agenda of G20. Cannot be, there will be an afterthought. You talk about everything and then you end up, okay, let's uh, have some people from Africa, from Asia, talk about your own thing. No. Same with inclusive trade. Same with the agenda I'm going to talk about. It cannot be, it cannot be just the afterthought or come after you have actually agreed on everything because the big hegemon is telling you that this is my agenda. So you come, you join, otherwise you just out. This cannot be, be like that. So what I'm saying is that this is, I have called this some years ago. I'm saying that again, and not because you're, we're all part of something which is related to Ang Tat, but I'm saying this is the Ang Tat moment. This is the Ang Tat moment. This is not the moment for hard, for hard, uh, 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 aggressive uh, negotiation processes. I don't think it will work out that way. We are now too much coming up to be more equal, and sometimes even more equal than people would expect, with the strengths of the capitals and the transferable technology, before too long, we would, we would see a different world. So it's not, it's not something that all these you know, people playing the same role, very, being very powerful all together, that they can agree on a single undertaking with 20 agenda, with 20 agenda, 170 of us talking. No, it cannot be done. So what we have to do is to try to dissect, to, to reduce all this global agenda into things that are really helping towards inclusiveness. Inclusiveness, sustainability, the agenda 2030. Agenda 2030, the most important agenda on that one. There are too many, there are, I don't know, 160, 70 targets. Uh, there are 17 goals. Goal 17 is for me the most important, if I remember correct, goal 17. It's about global partnership. It's about global partnership. It's about global governance that is to be participated by all the world, particularly the poor countries, the open countries. This is about inclusiveness. How you can, how you, can you see Asian participating IMF at the World Bank? No. At the moment, IMF belongs to the European. My friends from European, they should be happy. Small, small country in Europe, they hold big shares in, 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 in the IMF and they dictate. They have the controlling share, whatever IMF would decide to do. Uh, they want to give the role to the Chinese renminbi or not. They voted, now they said, okay, it's okay. And they voted on the quota reform for years. Christine Lagarde, my dear friend, head of the IMF, used to tell me that I would do belly dancing she would do belly dancing of all people, Christine. She would, this is what she said. I mean, this is not a secret. She said, I would do belly dancing if the US Congress would rectify the IMF reform. This is a reform of the quota that would allow all of us to participate. IMF is a global agenda. 
How come it could belong as a personal proprietorship of someone? And and least of all in Europe, which is coping with the worst kind of financial crisis ever, cannot be done. Would you lend? Would you lend to? Would you lend to? To somebody? Would you not lend to somebody who comes from your own household? I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm, let me not say this, but at least at the moment we should have a better balance of authority at that level. SDR, which has been asked by us at the AUN for time and time again that SDR should be elevated to more international level so that we can have a better liquidity support for international trade. Well, no, it's not. Cannot be done. The reform of quota. Inclusion of renminbi just allow now renminbi is part of, of, of SER, so that is done. But Chinese economy is still being quote unquote called non market economy. Russian market, Russian economy is a full market economy. Is this is this something which is comparable? Russian economy, full market economy, Chinese economy, non market economy. This is still part of the international organization. Uh, 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 agreement acceptance, which is for me not acceptable. Now, let me give you a few food for thoughts, uh, five five quick uh, uh, points, so that I can I can finish uh, the, the agenda that I thought. Why it's an untapped moment? It's a moment for soft for soft uh, uh, agreement, soft negotiations, uh, more or less something which you use the best practices. You you do the sustainability thing. You you try to convince that these are the best practices to be sustainable. And, you know what Angtad has been doing: sustainable stock exchange, uh, uh, sustainable investment, things like that. So this is nothing. The first thing that came to my mind is, is something that in Asia today and in poor countries around the world, the application of geographical indication. The GI is something which is. When I was there, I could not even mention the word GI in the. Lobbies of the WTO, because some of the major economists would just come up on me and say, "Look, you you just just be neutral. You don't support GI. GI must be supported. GI registration, GI elevation to the global is much needed. Because I I don't know if you know. I mean, in Europe you, they have three thousand or more than that of GI registration. In Asia we have a few hundreds. Maybe in India you have more. In India you might have a few hundreds. In Thailand we have about a hundred or ninety. And we're beginning to to have GI registration throughout Asia, and the French government has been very very helpful cooperating in help because the French are the are the one which has actually the the largest number of GI registration. So, and GI helped to increase the the premium price on on some of the products. It gives proud and pride to the place. It it let it let the community survive. It's good for the community development. It's good for food security because normally GIs are food-related things. It's a food things. It's a wheat. It's an egg. It's a I don't know a textile. So, first, my first point is that uh, we we need to promote geo geographical indication registration, facilitate it, have more agreement among countries that we recognize each other. Europe now recognizes a few GIs from Asia, and this is a good thing. We should do this around the world. The second one is about the new configuration of economic integration. I don't want to even say today that we we should have more free trade agreements. Free trade agreement is just very partial, very partial. You have a few food, you have a few goods that could be trade. What we should be doing now, and people are saying this all the time, they use the word partnership for everything. It's now economic partnership. It's Trans-Pacific partnership. It's a, it's a, it's a. What is it? RASEP is a partnership, a regional comprehensive economic partnership. It's all partnership. It's all partnership because we want to make economic integration inclusive. It must be partnership because not all are equal. When you take them all up, they cannot all abide by the rules. I mean, uh, look these days at the way ASEAN is being driven by two track, CLMV one track and the rest one track. And when I when I criticize TPP, I criticize TPP for one major thing: TPP never takes up the poorest part of of ASEAN into negotiation. They don't include the CLM. We can the CLM. We has been included. CLM, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar were never part of the TPP. So that's why I would say for Asian to be 
doing economic integration together, it must be a comprehensive economic integration. It must include trade, economic development, finance, mobility of people, river flows, uh, network of, uh, of uh, energy, everything all together. It must be like a regional development plan for the region. So this is one thing, and, and this actually, uh, I don't say that I influence, but this, what we have done at Angtat with UNESCO, we've done the Silk Road kind of thing way, actually, way before the One Bell, One Road. My colleagues from Angtat could testify to this. We've gone to several meetings together, but we want to drive forward the revival of Silk Road, not only purely on pecuniary economic benefits alone. We want it to be cultural. UNESCO was part of the cultural thing. UNESCO was actually the pregenitor of all these ideas on, on, on the, the, the revival of, of the Silk Road. And we did the work on the revival of the trade routes along the, 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 the land routes and the sea routes. We even have meetings somewhere outside of China in Korea because Korea used to be part of this maritime Silk Routes as well. So, uh, so these are the new configuration of economic corporations. The, the Silk Road, the, the Belt and Road, is actually an economic integration exercise. Formerly it would have been called a free trade agreement, but if it had been called a free trade agreement, nobody would have gone to the meeting in, in Beijing the other day. But when it's called Belt and Road and connecting Asia to, to Central Asia to Europe, now train runs from, from China, Chongqing, to London uh, in 16 days. It saved nearly two months instead of going through the other side of China. So now it's only once a week. I was told it would go to be twice a week, and then it going to be nearly every day and things like that. So it's happening, really, the, the, the land link with, with, uh, from Asia to Europe. And so these are new configuration which we should all support. They should not have to be negotiated, but supported by the work of the likes of, of Angtat, for example. The third point is on e-commerce. I'm saying this on e-commerce because we all agree, and it was discussed here, and you're going to have a good session. I, I really very curious of what will come out, because I'm very concerned with, with the new digital economy that is coming around. The new digital economy is going to be, the word they call is the disruptive. It will be more disruptive than we ever, ever have thought of. It will be more disruptive. Don't say that, oh no, I mean, it would not, it would create this, it would create jobs, it would create, well, it would be disruptive. But it could be disruptive in a constructive way. It will be something like Schumpeter's kind of thing, deconstruction in the old days, you remember? Schumpeter used to say that when we have new innovation cycle, it's deconstructive. It's destroyed the old modes of production, but it creates new ones. So this is something that we should create. But I raise this because of the but. Because of e-commerce, e the whole of e-commerce scenario today, it covers not only commerce, it covers logistics, it covers finance, money, it covers the cloud, the, the, the cloud computer, big data, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence. And those who own all this technology are just a few huge multinational firms. I'm just saying this because I want Angtat to look at this issue keenly. Maybe they have done this already in their investment report or something like that. Because if you look at the, the largest and most powerful corporation this day, compared to 20 years ago, just a whole new scenario. We don't see the old style, big corporation today anymore. These are all big, huge, Google, Facebook, Alibaba, I don't know, Alphabet, all these new names. And all the top five, I think, all the top five have all been fined, F-I-N-E-D, fined, penalized by international uh, arbitral uh, entities already, by Europe, by United States, one way or another. They've all been fine because they're too big, they're too powerful, they do search engine here, they come use it to something else. And now what, what, what worries me the most is that they all have collected all our data, all, our, all your data into what they call the, 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 the blockchain kind of thing. You, you have all your data in the future. Uh, bankers are not here, but uh, bankers, they know their fate, uh, you know, going to, uh, I don't know how it would uh, end soon, but anyway, they have to, to metamorph into something else because because the rise of the cashless society will be also not really a full demise, but we'll be facing out the financial system as we know. 
But ultimately, the control by all these MNCs. Some of us are now thinking of doing what we call social, what is it? Social assessment or personal adjustment, something like social personal adjustment assessment that you all, we all would have in, instead of all your license. Uh, you, you, you know, in Europe, I think they have this driver's license, and you have to score if you have. You know, done something wrong, they would score you on that. And if you have too many, too many mistakes, you've done so many violations, you you'll be taken, uh, you'll be taken out of the relation. You cannot have the license anymore. You cannot drive. Now, they are doing this in some areas, in some countries. That I was told, and I wouldn't mention name of the countries. In some countries, people say, "What is for somebody, some male who is courting." Uh, the family's daughter, they would ask, what is your score on the personal assessment card? Your score, if your score is below, is below seven from 10, just, just you, you don't count. You have to score eight or nine. If you want to borrow banks, if there ever be banks there, you have to score more than eight or nine to be able to score. And many things, you want to apply here and do the, all the things now, all these are in the cloud and everything's in the blockchain and all related programs that can control this. And they can use face, they can use personal thing. So it's, a, it's something which is beyond. Our, and so we have to begin to think of, we cannot limit all this. Because, for example, when Alibaba was talking that we are providing platform for all the SMEs to trade, Alibaba is owning some of the largest financial institutions in the world today. With Alipay and doing all these Chinese tourists, hundreds, millions of them going out in the world, they use only this pay and no banks are involved, and, and then you can pay on, the, on, their, on their smartphone. And this is going to happen all over. It, it's not that bad. It's very convenient for the people. But when all these large MNCs are controlling everything, we should, we should be very careful. Just, just, it's just two minutes. The, 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 the fourth one is on the evaluation of supply chain. I still, I still like the, uh, the, the UNCTAD uh, 2016 Trade and Development Report, UNCTAD 2000, last year. Uh, you, you should have a look. It actually deals with some of the issues of supply chain. We sometimes have too much of a blind faith in the way supply chain is being operated these days, and us in Asia, we just love supply chain. Thailand loves supply chain. We create AECs who enhance our supply chain and things like that. But Antat has a lot of important analysis to say on the supply chain. Because some of the supply chains are actually limited limited the choices of countries who are down, up there on the supply chain. There are a lot of, lot of concentration. Uh, but down below, a lot of competition, small players, you know, but up, up there, they're all people control everything. So to come up on the supply chain, it's, it, it's not that, that easy. And supply chain sometimes now replaces the industrial policy that Antarctica is almost just paranoid about because, and I do, I do agree, because supply chain cannot replace industrial industrial policy to help industrialize countries in an inclusive manner. And I would like to end now with the last issue of trade and currencies. These days, you know, when people look at uh, how to how to uh, push blame on somebody else and 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 to use a lot of uh, non-tariff measures, uh, whatnot, currencies are going to play a role more so than in the past. Uh, currencies uh, actually in themselves, you look at Japan, you, United States, Europe, currency in them, themselves do not determine now the trade flow. Uh, regrettably or not, I don't know, but it, it doesn't mean that when you have, well, Japan has been trying to push and push for the yen to come down, and yet Japan still cannot reach for the kind of reflation of their economy and selling more abroad. It's something else, it's a structural comparativeness uh, it's 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 a, it's a education investment in human resource and something else in innovation. It's it's many other things. But countries are using exchange rate manipulation as a as a as a ploy to you know uh, back at thy neighbor kind of policies and to to limit trade and put constraint on trade. This is not really justifiable. And of course, in Asia this day, we have learned with very sad lessons from two thousand from one. 1998, that we would not allow excessive borrowings, particularly in foreign currencies. So all these Asian economies that have been hit in those days are all accumulated huge reserves, huge reserves. And so gradually our currencies 
will be influenced because of the movement of the way we try to accumulate and reserves. And so there will be intervention by government in, into this exchange rate uh, market. And it will be difficult to pass a verdict on who is doing manipulation and wicking the market or not. And I, I just would like to advise that I don't think you, the WTO can actually deal with it. There have been efforts when I was there in Geneva to try to have some thoughts of some, some, some thoughts, uh, provoking processes, uh, dialogues on, uh, on currencies war. But it's not really the place to do it. It's IMF and maybe UNCTAD and the UN could initiate you know, some sort. UNCTAD has always been having the kind of good uh, uh, solution for this. UNCTAD has always been saying that in order to prevent currency war, we should have some codes of conduct. Codes of conduct. Code of conduct is not really a fast rule. I said we, we need soft laws, the kind of untouched laws that people can look at it, you use it, you don't like, you don't come to it. But if you like it, you can come together. Nobody forces anybody to come to the meeting. But at least, like in Asia, if we all are going to go through our appreciation of currency, we might as well go together and having a balanced, stable relationship among all these countries. And it would be better than just having the IMF telling us what to do and not to do, and most of the time, they, they would be wrong. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Sopachai Panichapak, the first keynote speaker. He really offers a new...